My name is George Edson. I'm chairman of the Montpelier Historical Society. And I'm going to start by letting Eileen Corcoran from the Vermont Historical Society invite you to the facility. Eileen. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Eileen Corcoran. I'm the director of service and outreach here at the Vermont Historical Society. And we're really pleased to welcome uh, such a wonderful crowd of folks here today uh, for the reception. Um, we always love to see people in the exhibit, and we're happy that we have air conditioning today as well. So um, thank you for, for, uh, for coming in on a, on a beautiful day with us. Uh, but one of the duties that I get to do at the Vermont Historical Society is work with uh, the Local History Gallery, which is where the Common Cracker exhibit is installed. The Local History Gallery is um, something that we created about five years ago uh, within our Freedom and Unity exhibit as a way to showcase uh, local history, local stories, and some of the wonderful and magical uh, events, people, and, and topics that we don't get to do uh, ourselves. And so it's really become this, this wonderful ability for us to have everything from exhibits on agriculture to women's history, uh, to fine art, to now crackers. Uh, and so I think that really showcases the, the amazing breadth and depth of history in Vermont. Um, and, and we really love being able to work with uh, places like the Montpelier Historical Society and, and people like George to bring those stories to light uh, and to give these small organizations a chance to showcase uh, the amazing work that they do uh, to a whole bunch of, of visitors, both from out of state and in state as well. So again, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. I do have to let you know, if you're not already a member of the Vermont Historical Society, we would love to have you as one. Um, you can have information on joining on our website, vermonthistory.org. We also do have social media uh, and an e-newsletter for folks um, who want to know everything about what we're doing and what's happening uh, at the Vermont Historical Society. So thanks again for coming. Welcome and enjoy. We have, we're here to celebrate the opening, and as such, we have a lot of friends and a lot of people that helped us put this together. Uh, and I mean, there's gonna be a number of introductions, but I'm doing this things a little bit out of order because one of, our, one of my stories uh, is a little time sensitive, and I'd like to start with that. So uh, I'd like to suggest that in, on a brisk October day in uh, 2001, my father went to the front porch at 47 Liberty Street to get his Sunday Times Argus and uh, brought in and took apart the various sections of the Sunday Times Argus and went to the Vermont Sunday Magazine and found an article, a, a cover article on Holy Smoke, Jeff Danziger's Warm Memories of Wood Stoves. And on this cover story is an old Vermont parlor uh, with a wingback chair and a pot-bellied stove and a wood box. And the wood box says Montpelier Cross Crackers. And so my father fired off a letter to Jeff, and I have a copy of that letter not here. And Jeffrey, uh, Jeff uh, fired back a reply, and it was all a very friendly exchange. I entered the subject then, and I wrote Mr. Danziger and I said, wouldn't it be nice if we could have the cover art, the original art for that cover? And he said yes, and he sent it to us and signed it and addressed it to, to my father, both articles of which are in the museum. And uh, we, we think that's kind of nice. This was not Jeffrey's first exposure to the common cracker. In 1980, when my family business, Cross Baking, closed their doors, uh, Mr. Danziger did the art for an article in the Rutland Herald, and it shows an old Vermonter, and he's sitting in front of a bowl of soup, and in the soup is floating some common crackers, and the old Vermonter has a hammer in his left hand. <laughs> I've never quite understood the significance of the hammer. But anyway, we have today with us, we're very lucky to have Jeff Danziger with us, and I'd like him to, to comment on every everything I've said and uh, swap lives with him. And uh, Mr. Danziger, take it away. I don't really have 
have anything, any remarks prepared about crackers. Uh, but I'm happy to be part of the uh, history of Vermont uh, drawing for the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus uh, for almost 45 years now. So uh, if you go back into the archives of those newspapers, you'll find various drawings, uh, some good, some bad, some in between. And uh, uh, I guess I will just continue to keep on doing it. Uh, that's very nice that the state has some good papers. <clears throat> it also has the Burlington Free Press. <laughs> Absorbent, I can say that for it. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't have any other comments. I'm, I'm happy to be here, and if there's any questions, I would uh, happy to answer it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you coming. This has been important. These, these two uh, pieces hang in my house and have for uh, 12, 12, 10 years. Uh, I guess the math would be on that. So I thank you very much for taking the time to come up here today. Uh, let's start with thanking our underwriters. We wouldn't be able to do this without them. And uh, they would include Ben and Jerry's Foundation, Cabot Cheese, Community National Bank, uh, Doodles Print Serve, Frederick and Mary Bashera, Lake Champlain Chocolates, and we have Allison Haynes Myers here from Lake Champlain Chocolates, a nice uh, local girl, born and brought up in central Vermont. Lyman Orton and the uh, Vermont Country Store Lyman, right here. Yeah, Mrs. A.C. Sprague, who is the daughter of Louise Andrews Kent. National Life Group, the Preservation Trust of Vermont, Union Mutual Insurance, and Vermont Mutual Insurance Group. And we thank them all for their contributions to this project. Uh, I, I have a number of family members here. I'm only, I'm, I'm, luckily, I'm only going to introduce the immediate family, starting with my, with my wonderful wife, uh, we've been married 38 wonderful years, 55 total. And uh, <laughs> they introduce us, they say, this is George and Jill. You'll like Jill. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, my wife, Jill, put your hand up. <laughs> Daughter Elizabeth in the doorway. to applaud after each one. Her husband, Eric. <laughs> Daughter, Nina. Mm -hmm. Nina, hand up, hand up, hand up. Okay, and uh, daughter, Emily. Where is Emily? Emily is back here. Oh, Chris Ashley? Yes. Yeah. She's here, too. Uh, did you want to know if you wanted to say anything? Not yet, but you're coming up. Yeah, and uh, Emily has two sons. Emily's all the way here from Austin, Texas. Emily has a son, Max, who is somewhere. Raise your hand. And, and Oliver, Oliver, you're a little shorter. Would you stand up, please? <laughs> Oliver, I think, has some prepared remarks, Oliver. <laughs> OK. Uh, I also have, uh, oh, by the way, I meant to say Jill Carnahan Edson. So those of you that have been around long enough in central Vermont would remember her father, Dr. Ansel Carnahan, veterinarian, who practiced uh, veterinary medicine on this street as far as you can go, the last property on State Street in Montpelier, for 40 years, along with his trusty sidekick, uh, wife and partner, Annie. And we have another uh, Carnahan girl here who would be Connie. Connie, right back there, raise your hand. Connie brought along her husband, Paul, and Paul, Paul, Paul is my favorite brother-in-law, my only brother-in-law, 
And Paul we employed as our grammarian here. So everything in the other room was checked by Paul for grammar, punctuation, and spelling. So before you leave, if you'd please check carefully and uh, let me know. <laughs> so that's the family. Now, I would be very proud to introduce uh, the members of the board of the Montpelier Historical Society, starting with Jennifer Boyer, Vice Chairman. <laughs> Bev Hill, Secretary. <laughs> Catherine Ware, Treasurer. <laughs> Paul Carnahan, recently retired librarian. <laughs> the Leahy Library. Uh, Corinne Cooper. Danny Cohn left. Danny has a gig in Marshfield at, at uh, 4 o'clock, and Danny was here but left. Mike Doyle. And uh, Steve Ribellini. The only director not here is Thumper Colombo, who had a previous engagement. And, and I call that a pretty darn good board of directors, so uh, we'll, accept, uh, we'll accept accolades for that group. George. Uh, Oh, Eric Gilbertson, did I? Who did I forget? Eric. Eric Gilbertson. I have a list here. I don't really miss it. Eric Gilbertson. Very fortunate to have Eric. Eric has uh, been associated with the Preservation Trust of Vermont for ages and was a historic preservation officer for the state of Vermont. Uh, very lucky to have Eric on our board. Uh, now, David Sheets, I didn't see David. David was to be here. David is the state curator of Vermont and is a great friend of the Vermont Historic Montpelier Historical Society. And I would like to uh, thank David for all that he does for us. OK, we're going to go next to sort of the end of the story. And that is when my family business closed their doors in 1980, there was an auction. And Lyman Orton came to that auction. And Lyman Orton bought some equipment at that auction. I'm going to invite Lyman to tell us what he did. Okay. May I? Vermont Country Store. Lyman Orton. Thank you. Packed it with relatives, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been buying common crackers at the Vermont Country Store from uh, Cross over in, uh, on the river. Canal of the river and um, for a number of years, but we never could quite get enough. And their, some of their other business was declining. Didn't you make white bread for um, um, private label grocery stores or something? Lost two cents a loaf on that. Yeah, I think three. <laughs> three, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a very good business. Um, anyway, sadly, um, they said they were going to have to close the cracker business. and. My dad and I talked about it for about 20 seconds and said, he said well, why don't you go and see buy that equipment and maybe we can make them. And we didn't sort of think about who the hell's going to know how to make them. But we went over, I went over with one of my guys and kept bidding and buying and stuff like that and bought enough that ovens and presses and little the presses that cook, make the, the crackers and cut them out and so forth. And you know, so I thought I'd done a pretty good job. And then a guy comes up to me and said, um, I'm glad you bought all that. I said, who are you? He said, I'm Bob Mills. Who are you, Bob? Oh, yeah. oh there you are. So um, and I said, what do you do, Bob? He said, I make the crackers. I'm the cracker baker. And I said, hmm, this is pretty good. He said, you thought about getting a job? He said, I'm looking for a job. Anyway, long story short, about before we was done there, we um, had a deal where he was going to come over and, and make the crackers. And we didn't exactly know where, so we first started making them on the, in an L we had out uh, back of the country store in Rockingham on 103. Set that up uh, as a cracker making, and that's Bob, that's where you uh, and the crew set up these contraptions. This stuff was what, 1890, Bob, or so, in the late 1800s? You said it was. It was probably around 1850. 
that early, okay, all right, yeah. And it was a Rube Goldberg kind of an affair, very, not terribly efficient, but when you're the only one gonna do it, uh, it seems like a pretty good thing. So we, we went into that business and still making them. Some years later, I, I kept looking at it and I go, you know, I wonder what else we could make on that. And that's when we come up with these cookie buttons that I brought some boxes of those back there on the same cutter, made them, the, what size are they gonna be? I said, whatever the size of that cutter is. So, <laughs> so like a good Vermonter, just use that and turn in, turning those things uh, out as well. So the people who are, make this all happen are standing over here, and on my right is Julie Lanfer, who's in charge of all the cracker business and the bacon of them, and to her right on the left um, uh, is Kara Suya, and her job is the director of the entire Vermont Country Store Distribution Center up in North Clarendon, Vermont, and that's a one-armed paper hanger in itself, right? So, and I think we said, well, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to take on the cracker business too. So she, she did, but that's a heck of a job. So these ladies uh, put them out and it's, and it's great and I love to go there. Bob Mills told me that every once in a while you get three crackers stuck together and they throw them away. I said, don't throw them away, I can sell them. And he, he said, well, they're rejects. He's like you said, you can eat them, right? What, are they, what did you call them in the bakery, Bob? We used to call them triples. Can't, can't use that word anymore. Triples, but stuck together, that's very unusual. So I think you could probably get a dollar for each We always threw them away, so you never Yeah, yeah, them. well, that's, that's why you went out of business. <laughs> Just, um, so it's been such a joy to have rescued the Vermont, what we call Vermont Common Cracker, that Bob was telling me that has over, had over 10 different names uh, in, and was made in about 10 different towns in Vermont. Right, Bob? Right, that's correct. Can you reel off some of those towns? Well, it was, of course, Montpelier Crackers right here in Montpelier, yeah. St. John's Berry Crackers, right. Memorial Crackers up in Morrisville, Beaches Burlington Crackers, and there was Crackers in White River Junction that were made, they were called Hanover Crackers, came from the first Hanover, New Hampshire. Yeah. And then down in Brattleboro, there was a baker down there, Joel Cutler, uh, who started about, about the same time that Timothy Cross started here in Montpelier. But his bakery got sold like 15 different times in a matter of 50 years. I don't know what their problem was, but they kept passing it on to somebody else. But no, they were still making them until about 1920. Um, but, um, did I miss anybody? Oh yes, there's two cracker bakers in Rutland. There was the Rutland Cracker Company and another private, private company. The guy started in 1853 by the name of Verder. And he and his son ran it and then they sold it to, around uh, 1879, they sold it to a gentleman by the name of, I think it was Lyon, something Lyon, I don't remember his, was it? I don't remember the first name. Oh. And, then Lyon sold it after to a guy by the name of Hogue, and Hogue ran it for a few years, and then he sold off to Nabisco in 1897, and Nabisco shut it down. <laughs> so that was, that was, and, uh, in 1892, the Rutland Cracker Company closed up after 10 years, so they went away. Um, there was also somebody up in Middlebury, and somebody in Ludlow. So there were 10 cracker bakers in Vermont between uh, 1850 and 1890. Well, look, there wasn't transportation. You know, the old saying, you can't get there from here, was really true back then. I mean, you had to have them spread out. That Crackers were one of the great local products that um, covered the whole state of Vermont population, guys know. And that's, that's what they were, they were local. Yeah, So yeah. that's why there were so many different bakers, because you didn't yeah. have the trucks to transport the crackers. You didn't have electricity. These were all run by steam engines or a horse walking on a treadmill. Yeah. It's a different time. Yeah. And the crackers themselves were, you know, today we all look at these things and we talk about hammers for the crackers, but um, you know, my wife and I told her we were doing this. You see, she's not here today. She said, you're crazy. You've got to be crazy. 
She said, you do it on the hot dog bowl, not the cracker. <laughs> but nobody in my generation, or a lot of you are my generation, not too many of us know what a common cracker is. And I found that my kids, they don't know what it is. Well, of course, my kids do because I was involved in it. I mean, they're friends. They have no clue what it is. Yeah. And so when I was telling a few people I was involved in this exhibit, the same thing came up. What's a common cracker? And then they tried to be nice and say, well, I guess you can eat them if you, if you split them or you do this and you do that. They didn't really, I tried to explain to them that they were a food stuff, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I gather there's nobody in this room who doesn't know why the hammer was in the... <laughs> right? I mean, if you don't know, raise your hand. But being Vermonish, I'd be ashamed if I were you would raise my hand. So, of course, crackers and milk and cheese, that's why you've got to bust them up. And, agenda. and that's what we used to have for supper with a little popcorn on the side. and. Um, that you have to bust them up to get them to soak up. And kind of, the only thing that made them really good was the cheese. No, I don't want to say that. The cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, now where's Gardner, my son? This is my son, my middle son, Gardner Orton. And Gardner's two-year-old boy, um, born in July, but his name is August, two years ago. <laughs> and I doesn't have anything to do with this, but you know, I'm a grandfather and there's three others. So, and Gardner does what every good parent of a little kid going heathen kept feeding him crackers, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, no. He, he, he. He gave him the cheddar ones. He liked those more than the plain ones. <laughs> no, but that's, isn't that true? Every, everybody, knows that who has grandchildren and children back in that day that you gave them common crackers because they're rock hard and <laughs> absent the hammer. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. So it's been a great, a great thing to have revived the cracker and kept it in Vermont and keep it going and put it in the catalog and online and all that. And we don't ask what people do with them when they get them home. So <laughs> whatever that is. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. One more member of the Vermont Country Store group is Janice Brown, another baker over here. We want to recognize. Okay, I, I, let me uh, pick up on the Bob Mills thing. Bob uh, worked for our company until he went to work for Lyman's company. And so I've known Bob for close to 50 years, 49 years. And uh, we became, um, we didn't have much to do with each other for a number of years. And a year ago now, I looked him up, called him up, and told him what I was doing and asked if he wanted to help. Well, Bob has been invaluable. Uh, research, writing, uh, he remembers things, I don't, uh, as you can see. And, and uh, we emailed, uh, he came to my house and sat at my kitchen table. We drove to this gallery and sat in there and planned it. We emailed hundreds of emails. Uh, one of those emails, he and his wife share an email address and one day I emailed him and the subject line was my favorite beach. My wife and I summer in winter in Florida. And I sent him this email saying my favorite beach. And uh, his wife got up in the morning before him and opened the email very anxiously to see what my favorite beach was. And it turned out it was a beach cracker box. <laughs> she was some unimpressed. So anyway, that's it. I, I just can't say enough about Bob. OK, one of the things we, we did here, or I, we tried to do, was to tell some side stories. So you got the common cracker. What is it? How was it made? Uh, but uh, I was aware of the fact that that the cracker was advertised on some Grange stage curtains. And I was aware of the fact that the Montpelier cracker was advertised on some stage curtains. So I turned to Chris Hadsel, who is the head of Curtains Without Borders, and Chris is with us today, and she's gonna tell us just a little, I'm sure you all went in and looked at everything in there. There is a reproduction of the of the Middlesex Grange curtain that is now hanging in Worcester. So Chris, tell us just a little bit about that. All right. 
Well, we also have Patty Wiley while we're at it. Patty is from the from the Middlesex Historical Society, and it, they actually own it or whatever. It's, it's a long, convoluted story, but Chris, go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna tell you even less than Jeff Danziger managed to tell you, <laughs> you know? Um, yes, well, actually, we met when I was down with a group of people restoring the Claremont uh, Opera House Theater Curtain, which is a great big, opera house curtain, bigger, bigger than a normal person would want to take on. But we did manage to restore it, and I stayed with you um, at that particular time because they were volunteers for that, opera, for that thing. And we got to talking. I think we talked about Fairbanks scales, and we talked about, somehow we got on to Cross Crackers. And I said, well, I have three boxes from Cross Crackers. And he said, I don't have any. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we'll give you one. So I did. Is it in the exhibit? All right, good, I haven't been, had a chance to see it. That's because I bought a farmhouse in St. Jay in 1970 from a long dead um, person named Orange Roberts, who had worked for the Montpelier Cross Cracker Company, but then it moved to St. Johnsbury. I think he was a trucker. I mean, I think he delivered crackers. I don't know. But we had cross cracker boxes galore in the uh, shed outside. And I saved three of them before that barn, not the shed, it was in a barn. The barn burned, but I did save three of them. So I have one for each thumb, and I've given one to you. And so I had this connection with cross crackers that I thought was really pretty interesting. And uh, old Orange Roberts from St. Johnsbury Center had obviously worked for them for years. And coincidentally, I knew that there were advertisements on some of the Grange Hall curtains for Cross Crackers, because we restored every curtain in Vermont, all 193 of them. And uh, one of them was in Middlesex, one of them in St. Johnsbury. Well, guess what? I mean, they were where there was at least one of your bakeries. I don't know if they made crackers there or the bread, but they were certainly there. And that curtain now is at the St. Johnsbury Middle School. And I remembered the Cross Cracker ad because I had this personal interest in Cross Crackers. And I think there's one other, but I'm blanking on where, oh, bear, in the one in the Vermont Historical Society, I think the Berlin Corners advertising curtain also has a Cross Crackers ad, and that's natural. They were near Montpelier. And so I told George about it, and um, I'm sure you explored actually bringing the whole curtain, but I sort of discouraged you. It's, it's a big job to take down a, what, 15, 16, 18 foot curtain, 18 by say 10 foot high, get it down the stairs, get it into a truck, get it here, and then you get back up the stairs. It's a big job, and I had done that. I'd actually brought it to the State House one year to show it off, I think before we finally installed it. That's how we avoided all those up and down stairs. Because Dave Sheets and I, used, we used to show one curtain a year at the State House in the cafeteria. And we did about 10 of them. But each time it involved getting a school bus and dealing with the fact that we had to take them down and put them up. And it was, it was real, really difficult. But that curtain did come for a month to the State House. So I'm sure a lot of you saw it. Well, we also had it in um, the theater, the, what's it called, the theater that's next to the old opera house, downtown. Lobby the actual- Lobby Theater? Yes, we put it in their lobby for a while as well. Um, so anyway, I'm very pleased that he that, you know, took the initiative to make a, a photographic copy of the curtain, rather than trying to bring the whole thing here. And um, these curtains were, in every Grange Hall, they needed to have a way to roll something up to have a reveal. It was usually a, um, a kind of a staged reenactment of the founding of the Grange or something else to do with one of the degree ceremonies. And in order to have a reveal, you have to have something that you pull up because this is all before there were drawstring curtains. 
So every stage in Vermont, or every range certainly, and most stages in Vermont, had these painted theater curtains. And um, you can go on our website and see them all. <laughs> and uh, I also did finally do a book which includes the, um, the Worcester curtain. And um, what else? Jeff, anything else? <laughs> no? Nothing else? Starts. Okay, I'm going to quit. If he says to quit, he's the boss. And relative to the stage curtain, I want to make a couple more comments. One is that uh, David Book from Worcester uh, Historical Society helped us out also on this project. Paul Richardson of StoryWorks did the photography, and that was professional photography in order to be making the reproduction. Dan Emmons of Fast Signs of Burlington produced it. You can't get just anybody to produce something that big in the way of a banner. I'd like to see this uh, have a life that goes on from here, and I envision that uh, being other places, it's got a National Life ad on it. It might, might look nice in the National Life lobby for a period of time. Maybe, maybe Montpelier City Hall. There's a lot of Montpelier ads on there that would mean things to people that have been around for a while. Uh, in Vermont National, I mean, uh, the, 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 one of the insurance companies is on there too. So that's, that's the stage curtain. Now, the next uh, side story, uh, is about crackers and milk. And crackers and milk, we all, we all, most of us have heard about the concept of crackers and milk, whatever that is. And crackers and milk is a, is a diet that was prevalent in the 1800s. And what happened was that mother made a meal on Sunday at one o'clock. Well, mother didn't want to make another meal at six o'clock. So Sunday night was crackers and milk. So that is a subject that we, that we enjoyed uh, approaching. And we got a book uh, through Susan Kane of the Tunbridge Fair, a, a box in there. And one of the boxes features a picture of a, of a young man eating his crackers and milk. And we also found my father kept everything. And he had some old printing plates. And they were corroded. And they were dirty. And they were bent. You couldn't even tell what they were. And so uh, after much searching, I, I, I found Sarah Smith, Sarah Smith, of the, uh, who is director of the Book Arts Workshop at Dartmouth College. And she had her students print these. And those plates are in it at that exhibit. And not, and not only the plate, but what they printed from the plate. And those plates have the same picture as the box that we got from the Tunbridge Fair. So it really makes quite a neat little story. In addition, Teresa Green from the Vermont Historical <coughs> Society produced a faux fake uh, crackers and milk. They wouldn't allow any real food in the display. So Teresa Green created what you see in there, which is crackers and milk, which is fake. She also created some fake crackers. And uh, they're sprinkled around that display box, and they're just beautiful. They look as real as they could look. Uh, so that is one of the display pieces in there. Uh, now, I'm not sure anybody still, still has crackers and milk on a Sunday night. Uh, or, or do they, Steve Jocelyn? Would, would you tell us? Steve Jocelyn just happens to be here. Uh, Steve Jocelyn of the Waitsfield Jocelyn clan. Uh, Steve, <laughs> tell us all about, do you still drink, eat crackers and milk? I still eat crackers and milk. <laughs> and, and you enjoy I it? I have since I could consume solid food, and that accounts for the fact that I look the way I am, and I'm 104. <laughs> <laughs> One year ahead of me in high school. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I saw a Cousin Ted today. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I see the Jocelyn... Uh, 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 reunion pictures on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> As a side note, Chris, you lived in the Stark District, correct? Oh, you're that Johnson? <laughs> no, no, wait. Did you live there too? I was Dave Clark's na neighbor, and we used to gather sap out by your house. That's right. That's right. That's 
Crackers and milk, I can't think of a whiter subject to talk about. <laughs> Um, I, like I said, I've been eating cross crackers since I could consume solid food. I inherited the crackers and milk from my dad, who frequently on Sunday night and for lunches in the summer. And what you, what I say you need is a relatively deep bowl. And you start off with six crackers and crush them by hand, more if you want and then flood them with milk and let them sit a little while to take some of the crack out of them. And my dad always had cheddar cheese with the crackers and milk and he would send me over to me here in store uh, to get a sample off from the wheel and I'd carry it home and if it was acceptable, he'd send me back and I'd get a pound. <laughs> um, I still eat cheddar cheese, but I prefer sage cheese with my crackers and milk. There used to be a number of cheese makers in Vermont that made sage cheese. The only one I'm aware of now is the Sugarbush Farm in, in Woodstock, which I highly recommend for their sage cheese, their horseradish cheese. It's a, it's a neat place to go to. Um, we didn't always have crackers and milk on Sunday night. Sometimes we had popcorn and milk. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with popcorn and milk, but it's buttered popcorn in a bowl of milk, and you eat it like they eat it like you would cereal. And it's very good, but I'm probably one of the only ones that still. I also occasionally have crackers. I split them and put a dab of peanut butter on. Tradition, but I try to keep it pretty <laughs> Avermonte and just crackers and milk. Anybody got any questions on the <laughs> exciting meal of crackers and milk? You had to prove that it's real. How many have you? How many of you have eaten crackers and milk? Wow. Good. And I. Thank the Ortons for continuing it um, because it got me this far. So, then in Oklahoma, we had cornbread and milk. I have never heard, heard of this. This is not a cornbread show. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't forget you said that. thank a number of people who have contributed items here, uh, most of which I don't think are, are here, some of which are not here. Peggy Pearl and Jennifer Payne of the St. Johnsbury Historical Society, Pat Stark of the Hartford Historical Society, Tom Cross, who is a, an antique dealer in Burlington. Uh, Brooke Page is here. Brooke Page is uh, the most prolific collector of common cracker items anywhere. Brooke, where is Brooke? Brooke, only in front of me. And, and uh, Kendall, Kendall Spavincure, and How Scales, uh, probably the biggest, uh, most varied collector of antique items in the state of Vermont. Thank you, thank you, Brooke. Uh, okay, we have Louise Andrews Kent. I grew up at, uh, at 47 Liberty Street with my mother having the cookbook called Mrs. Appleyard's Kitchen. And I was very aware of Mrs. Appleyard and Mrs. Appleyard's love of Montpelier crackers. Mm -hmm. And she has numbers of recipes in here that involved a Montpelier cracker. And uh, it, there's a story in here. I, I knowing of, of, of her and the background of the cracker, uh, I included a wall hanging in there of hers. And it's a story out of there. You want to read the story, but I can briefly tell it in about two sentences. And that is that somebody wanted to steal the, uh, the idea of the common cracker out west. So they took a baker from Montpelier, and they sent him out there, and they gave him everything. They called it the secret rule. A rule is a recipe. 
So he had the secret rule, and he had all the ingredients, and he had the right flour, and he had everything, but the crackers didn't come out right. And they made them again, and they didn't come out right. And they finally figured out it's because he didn't have the Montpelier water. Well, come on, so Berlin water, George. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so anyway, uh, what we have here uh, uh, involved or was in touch with Mrs. A.C. Sprague, daughter of Louise Andrews Kent. We have two granddaughters of Louise Andrews Kent with us today. Uh, Janet Ansel, who is a high school uh, uh, classmate of mine, and her sister, Olivia Gay. Janet Ansel and Olivia is here. So Olivia might, might, might share a word about her grandmother, Louise Andrews Kent. Thank you, George. So, um, George got in touch with Janet, and Janet got in touch with me, and our now 100-year-old aunt, Rosamond Sprague, lives in South Carolina, and I go, I, taking care of her, managing her affairs, turned me into a snowbird, I'm happy to say. And uh, so I go down there every winter, and um, George sent us some wonderful materials that I shared with her. And it pleased her very much to have her mother remembered in this way. Um, so our grandmother, even though she used an unconscionable amount of butter in most of her recipes, was also very interested in natural foods and, and simple foods. And uh, certainly the common cracker fits into that category in a big way. And so from early on in her cookbooks, this is uh, her first cookbook. There are other cookbooks that she wrote with our mother, um, Elizabeth Kent Gay, which are the summer kitchen and the winter kitchen. And this one has, uh, the recipe is to soak the crackers and then bake them, which makes them fluffy. So, yes, so, uh, and, then, and then you can do other things with them. But in one, in, I don't know if it's probably in the winter kitchen, there's a recipe that I use many times as, as one of my party tricks, which is to cut the crackers in half and spread them with chutney made to my grandmother's rule. And if you don't have your own chutney, then you use your sister's chutney, which she generously <laughs> shares with you and top it with some uh, cabot cheese and just run them under the broiler for not very long. If you leave them too long, they burn and then that's not a good thing at a party. So, uh, but they're very tasty and it softens the cracker a little bit and the, the, the bite of the chutney and the mellowness of the cheese uh, turns out a wonderful hors d'oeuvre, a Vermont hors d'oeuvre. So, um, I think our grandmother would be pleased to have this recognition. Um, she loved to write about Vermont, particularly about the Vermont landscape, and uh, this story of the, the, the efficacy of the Vermont water, the necessity of Vermont water, appealed to her sense of the pureness of, the Vermont, of Vermont and the beauty of Vermont. So she would be pleased to be included. Thank you. And uh, Kent name, of course, uh, uh, part of the Kent Corners. Kent's Kent. Corner. Kent's Corner. Like Many said, Kent's, one corner. Like I said, Kent, <laughs> Kent Corner uh, and uh, the Kent Museum, mm -hmm. uh, all, all affiliated with, or all connected with the, the Kent. And, and the Kent story itself is a wonderful story. So I, unless I missed a whole section here, I think I've touched on every single thing on my list, my wife told me this should last six minutes. Yes. Yeah. She confirms that Vermont water is the best in the world. I'm assuming that everybody here has also heard of mock mince pie. Oh, yes. And guess what that was made with? Crackers. Like I said, don't forget the mock mince pie. <laughs> made with the cross cracker. And uh, I mean, a common cracker. 
uh, I would invite anybody, uh, you know, somebody sitting here and said, oh my gosh, uh, I, I'd like to say this or that or whatever. Are there any questions or any other comments? So is there anything else? Be oh, let me say, there's stuff up back. There's some, some free stuff. There's, there's crackers. Uh, there's some more um, things there that my daughter made, but whatever they are. And uh, there's, uh, there's chocolates, Lake Champlain chocolates. And, uh, and, they might be good on a cracker. And stuff. I, 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 I agree. Look, whatever you said, I agree. Yeah. And um, okay, any any questions? Anybody have to say something? Yes, Elizabeth. Please take cookies. They're delicious, and you all deserve them. So the boxes are out. These are Vermont Country Store cookies, right? And they're free. Little cakes. And the picture, I'm proud. One of them's dark, I'm in the middle. Oh, and the other two are the other. It's too bright. And Lyman, if it's somebody was telling me uh, when I was talking about Callus and all these different things, your store, your family business started in Callis, right? North Callis. Like North I said, Calus. North Callis. <laughs> And uh, you were you were in business with the teach outs. Well, my my grandfather, Gardner Lyman Norton, that's the name, um, uh, was married to a teach out, and her name was Lilia Teach Out, and her father was Melvin Teach Out, and Melvin. And my grandfather had a store in North Callis, 1897, called Peach Out Orton. And it looked just like the one in Weston, burned down years ago, many years ago. But that was um, my father's experience in growing up in that store, uh, stayed in his memory. And that's how during <clears throat> the Second World War, he was working in the Pentagon, and he saw an ad that um, for Chase and Sanborn Coffee that had an image of the old guy sitting around the top of the stove, smoking their pipes, dog lying on the floor, doorkeeper in the background cutting shoes, and he said, God, I'm going back after the war and start a country store again. He was thinking catalog, of course, because he was in my he wanted to print, print. And then, then he put out the catalog, people started ordering, <clears throat> started writing in, we're coming up next summer to come to the store. I said, we're not going to the store after all. <laughs> I didn't have that store. <laughs> so we hustled around and lo and behold, there's a building for sale just off the Village Green, which is where this business is now. We bought, my mother and father bought that, and that became the store. So it all started in North Callis, so Vermont. <laughs> Teach Out is a name that was very we had teach out friends, close friends, growing up in Montpelier. So, so this all is all everything's connected. Okay, anybody else? Yes, David. David Perrin, my my relative. David and I go back in Berlin for till the 1700s. Go ahead, David. My mother always used to go up the road about a quarter of a mile to the Kraus Baking Company corner of State and Main Street, and she would buy a bag of split crackers. Got two questions. Number one is, why did they split coming out of the oven? And number two, how much did this bag of crackers weigh? It weighed about so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, these crackers, as opposed to most crackers, split. And you split them, and there's a picture of my father on a, on a post, on a wall hanging in there, splitting the cracker with his thumb. So it was a hockey puck type shape, and, and a little puffed, but it had a seam all the way around it. And it, as these do today. And you, and you, then you split it open with your thumb. So the only thing I can say is, is using this improper word of cripples, which is what we used back then, is they became cripples because somehow they became uh, disconnected in production. 
So that is what they, they sold them as kind of like seconds. Uh, how much it weighed and how much it cost, I didn't know. I wasn't there then. <laughs> yes, there. you were there. Did you work no, in the bakery? I, I grew up, uh, I worked with the Crossing Bakery for 10 years. And uh, I was born in 31, right after the Depression. And Crossing 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 was work. My dad would go down to get a barrel of crackers or whatever they happened to be in it. And uh, we lived on that for quite a while. But then I went in the airport and came back and I worked in the, in the bedroom for uh, 10 years. But while I was there, the, the crackers were in one end of the building and the wholesome bread on the other, I had to be working on the uh, uh, in the bread department, but we worked together. The, the guy that was picking uh, crackers, so I watched him yet. He would he was rugged. He at one time he could take two hundred pound bags of. Uh, uh, Flower on on his shoulder there, carried it off, and uh, well, anyway, I was watching him making the the dough, and then they rolled it out. He would work, put it out, roll it out, do it again. He keep folding it over and over just certain amount of time. Then he'd cut the cut the cracker out. You know. That's why that's how they to the be able to open them up. <laughs> yeah, and that's just the way they're made today and just the way it uh, works and there's a video in there and some I'm sure that, that given the circumstances here, many of you haven't actually Spend a lot of time in there. You might come back when there's nobody around, and uh, there's a video taken at the Vermont Country Store production with these people here that made them that would be kind of fun to watch. We had another point. Uh, this guy was so rugged. Uh, they had an oven on the first floor and a mixture up there. And uh, one, <coughs> one time when the mixer, the, 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 the uh, cracker one, he comes in a little bit earlier and uh, you know, it's just fire smoke coming up from the oven. And there's a fire somewhere. He gets the jack, 20, that skids of 25 bags of flour. He gets burning. The, the next room was uh, probably 30 inches higher. He could get started. He'd run that whole skid up there. He cleaned it all well. So when the fire department would come, get it out of it. Uh, quick, quick story. We were all done. I, I don't want to go any further. But uh, the bakery in Montpelier, which is where City Center is now, uh, and it was 101 Main Street. The bakery was made, well, it was uh, owned by just Charles H. Cross and his son L. Bart Cross was in business with him. And what they did was they started out with a building on the front on Main Street. And whenever he wanted to add on, he would just buy another barn. And he would move the barn up behind the building and then he'd move another barn up. Every one of these barns had different ceiling heights and different floor heights. So, in my memory, back in the 50s, the bakery was like this. It was not even. This was very common. If you look at the old maps of Montpelier, you look at downtown, uh, most every building downtown was, was, was built like this. So that just happens to be the way it was. OK, I really don't want to sure. answer, Corinne. I think this should end with a huge thank you to you for okay. being the time.